Start the recording. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. So my name's Chris Morrison. And my name's Jane Secker. And we are now running this is number 68 Yay. of the webinars, Copyright and Online Learning at a Time of Uncertainty. Absolutely. Do we need a rebrand on that? We might do. I'm yeah. not sure, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah. I think a sign of, I mean, as we've been talking about, the sun is shining today. Mm -hmm. Here we are, spring is coming together. So I think it's a time of optimism and hope, I would, I would suggest. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We'll um, see how the year goes. Yes. So uh, we're looking forward to having a really great presentation today. Yeah. Um, I will reshare the slides. I deliberately turned them off just so that we won't in the recording talking to just a black screen. Yeah. Or the title screen. Yeah. But yeah. Let's get and back everyone can see it. our lovely periodic everyone, yeah, table. Yeah. So we're wearing our periodic table. You've just uh, got a new one. I've got nice brown. Yeah. It's nice and new and fresh. Yeah. Mine's are, getting a bit faded. No, it happens. Um, yeah. T-shirts are available from copyrightliteracy.org. There is obviously a merch site you can get. Uh, tea towels, um, uh, aprons, and all those things for our copyright T-shirts. All those essential things. Uh, we may then have an ethical discussion later on about. Um, Shall I put that in the chat? For you can, you can do that about whether or not it's ethical to uh, use this as a platform to sell merch. You're under no obligation to buy. There are other um, T-shirt stores available. Well, there's the old T-shirt store. We should it put is. that in there. That's the thing to do. And no, then... I've just put ours in. Okay, fair enough. Yeah. Uh, so, what have we got today? We've got some copyright news. Uh, but the main event is uh, uh, guests Natalie Lafferty and Sharon Flynn joining us to talk about the Association for Learning Technologies Ethical Framework, yep. the FELT uh, Framework for Ethical Learning Technology, uh, which we're really looking forward to. So thanks for them to them for coming along today. Mm -hmm. um, so and we'll be talking about what we've got coming up next. We've got some webinars lined up. We've got some possible topics lined up as well. We and do. we are looking for some speakers, aren't we? So hang around at the end, please, because yes. yes. um, uh, we we definitely will want to um, share some of the, the plans for this year with you. Yeah, absolutely. Um, since we last met. Yes. So this, what, what was, I was preaching a sermon uh, in, at the University of Oxford last week, wasn't I? For those of you who attended Ice Pops in 2022, um, they will know that we had a last minute room change to be at the Catholic chaplaincy um, in Oxford. Um, and they were very welcoming. To they us. were. They were. Uh, yeah. And, and, but we were returning there. We were. Um, it was an interesting uh, effort to to turn that into a playful space back when we mm. were at Ice Pops. Mm. So mm. once again, you've got Sir Thomas More um, and I looking think down Car upon Cardinal you. Cardinal Newman. Cardinal as well. Newman. Yes. yes. But you were preaching about information literacy. I was. Yeah. <laughs> Um, my favourite subject to give a sermon on. Yes. Um, so yeah, it was great. Yeah. And then we got a bit, a little bit of copyright in there, but it was mostly yeah. information literacy because there's a whole programme of work happening at Oxford. So it's really mm. exciting, actually. Mm. We're looking you... to develop a digital and information literacy framework. We so, are. Which uh, copyright will be, um, yes, yes, the famously playful figure of Thomas More. <laughs> yes, Chris. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, that, that was all very good. As it a was. Kind of, we're thinking frameworks today. Today yes. is clearly Framework Friday. Definitely, yeah. I love a framework. I've spent okay. lots of time talking about frameworks. Um, we have week. the archive of all of these webinar recordings, um, the slides from previous webinars, the previous 67. Yeah, um, I'll just pop a couple of those good. links in the chat for people. Lovely. But I think everyone knows where these are, so there we are. So it's copyright news. It's copyright news time. What's well, been going on in the world of copyright? We haven't had a webinar for it's a been month a while. Or so. Yeah. Well, well um, I thought we ought to celebrate. It's International Women's Day today, mm -hmm. and uh, there are some fantastically amazing women in the field of copyright and yep. digital education. But what I wanted to just flag up was that some of the amazing um, people that we've spoken to on our podcast, some of the women that we spoke to um, in the last couple of years. So Emily Drabinsky, who um, is the current American Library Association She's president. rocking the ALA presidency. She is. She? Yeah. yeah, you can hear us chat to her. Um, you can hear Chris's little music, his walk up song he made for her. Um, uh, uh, Caroline um, Ball as well, who's yep. um, 
at University of Derby. Mm -hmm. um, we had a great conversation with her um, a couple of years ago about yeah. her copyright fan fiction. Uh, we have a son, Esteve, who's at uh, the University of Barcelona, yeah. who we talked about open access. And I think you got um, a sort of famous uh, a Spanish guitar player, didn't you, to sort of write a song? Yeah, there. well, I think yeah. I think it may or may not have been a, uh, Enrique Iglesias yes. who, who soundtracked that yeah. one. Yeah. Um, and the first one that we, first guest podcast we ever did was yeah. with... Um, Eleonora uh, Rosati. Yeah, who was, uh, so that was that was really great. We And uh, we don't have it yet out but there is an upcoming uh, interview we've already recorded with uh, Karis Craig, Professor Karis Craig, who's yeah. um, uh, over in Canada. And actually her research is specifically around critical and feminist approaches to copyright law. Yeah. Um, so that would have been one if we'd actually got out got and, out out and, actually, <laughs> and editing it, it would be, but that's a really great one. And in yeah. fact, her her answer to the question, what's her favourite sweet treat, was probably one of the best answers we've ever had. Just don't give anyone on it. I'm not going to give it away. Because we haven't done the editing. No, I know. But anyway, that's all to come. We'll get there. It'll come. It'll come. It's like yeah. all good things. It'll, it'll like the spring. Yes. Well, there'll suddenly be a flourish of copyright literacy, like Blossom. Mm. It'll be wonderful. So the next item, we talked about the Alt Cool SIG, the Copyright and Online Learning Special Interest Group. Um, and our time as chairs was up. Yes, we've three, done three we've years. We've done three years service. So we went and asked if there would be someone who would be interested or any group of people interested in taking over. Um, and we can now reveal that the new Alt Cool Sig co chairs are the same as the old Alt Cool Sig. That's us in those t shirts. In the same t shirts. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the way that it worked out is nobody else put themselves forward as co chairs. We said we would agree uh, to continue on that basis. We've got an upcoming committee meeting. Yeah. We intend to continue with the webinars. We do. We're kind of carrying on, but not just doing exactly the same as what we've done. I think we still want to make sure that we're... And we've got a couple of new people who've yeah, come forward to join our committee as we well, do, indeed. which we're really excited so about. So we are looking and we're forward very, to fresh yeah. ideas. We're not, yeah. not going to get stale. No, nope. no, nope. definitely not. Okay. No, no. So watch this space, really, yeah, I guess. Yeah. Oh, this is this is an exciting. This is me, isn't it? it Information is literacy and AI. Um, this I think is um, proving to be a very popular event. It's a panel discussion um, that's taking place on the twentieth of March um, online um, at uh, lunchtime, so one o'clock. There's a few tickets available. We'll probably make some more available because it is proving so popular. But we're going to be talking about information literacy and artificial intelligence, and I'm chairing this, so this is a shameless plug from me. Um, uh, with my information literacy group hat on uh, but but yeah very popular event um and do um have a look at that and there's some great speakers as well talking about ai um in all different contexts um and how it relates specifically to information literacy i've got an inkling that this topic might come up later in the conversation today it may well do yes okay. yes yes and um, this is to let you know that there is an upcoming webinar on controlled digital lending. This is something for, available to Sconnell members that uh, we will be uh, part of. Yep. And in fact, we will be talking about a briefing that we have written uh, for Sconnell and Research Libraries UK. So this is a, going to be a closed meeting. And JISC. And JISC as well. Yeah, in fact, JISC have uh, been instrumental in, in, yes. in commissioning and supporting this work. Yeah. Uh, so this is something I'm, I'm sure will be of interest to many of the people mm -hmm. um, and I think that the, the the briefing paper will probably be going out uh, I'm assuming mm. ahead of the uh, I don't know that that's the actual launch of it is yeah. it on the 8th but we yes so if you're interested in this clip we will we'll be sharing stuff on the various lists as yeah. well this copy seek and if you're not already a member of the CDL JISC mail list and you are interested in controlled digital lending I would recommend joining that yeah Absolutely. You're going to pop the link into that one or do you want me to do that? Uh, I can do that. OK, I'll go on to our next item. Um, next item, just a, a reminder um, uh, that coming up in May is the SILIP Copyright Conference. Um, it's held online on Zoom, but I know um, it's again got the theme of copyright and AI and ethics. So there's an overlap with some of the topics we're talking about today and then a great lineup of speakers. I think Matt Lambert is speaking from the British Library yes. and I believe Caroline Ball is speaking as well. Yes. Um, and yeah, lots of other people. So um, do have a look at that. Um, and um, hopefully um, 
that looks like that's going to be a promising event. Yeah. So, yeah. And next item was just a news item I picked up. Mm -hmm. um, I think I picked this up off uh, Matt Voigt, who is still doing his fantastic copyright news um, from a sort of international perspective. Um, so this is a research that's been done by um, Communia, who do lots of research kind of public domain and creative commons and kind of all those sorts of areas. Um, it's looking at researchers' perspectives on working with copyright um, across Europe. And I think it's based on a survey of things like how copyright exceptions work and what impact it has on the work of researchers. I'm interested in this just because we've been working quite frantically on analysing our copyright anxiety data, haven't we? we have. And yeah, yeah. it's causing a lot of anxiety trying to we're gonna, we're make gonna, sense of it. We're going to get it sorted today. Yeah, We're going to get the post-it notes out later. We are, yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, But I think that there's some really interesting um, findings in this research that mm -hmm. I'm sure we will be wanting to reflect on as we write up our, our findings as well. Yeah, so, so just as a reminder, Communia, organisation that kind of came out of the work around Europeana and opening up um, collections within Europe and, and addressing some of those copyright issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think that might be it. Yeah. So I think we're ready to introduce our special guests. Yes, absolutely. We're really, really pleased that Natalie Lafferty from the University of Dundee and Sharon Flynn from Technological Higher Education Association are coming to talk to us about the work that they've done uh, and with colleagues on the uh, ethical uh, framework for ethical learning technology that's been a stream of the um, Association for Learning Technologies work. So one of the really good things about our group being and actually creating a special interest group um, as part of ALT is that we see the, the great work that's going on elsewhere and mm. we're able to kind of link things together and we hope we are. I think there are some clear links and we've had it in our mind for some time between uh, copyright, how we deal with copyright law, how we deal with all the questions that come up within the copyright specialist community and uh, the bigger, broader questions about ethics and law and new technologies and the use and implementation of technology. Um, so I don't think we really want to say much more. I think no, like Natalie, Sharon, Natalie Sharon, and you're, Sharon, you're there. We had a chat to you at the start, but hopefully you, everything's working OK. We will get your slides up to share. Hi, Natalie. Hello. Good morning. Hello, Sharon. Hi. Hi. I'm here. Hi, we can hear you both perfectly. Great. Perfect. Okay, so your slides are up. Hopefully, they're still working for you uh, to uh, advance if you wish uh, when you need to, um, and we'll hand it over to you. Yeah, so take it away. Thanks very much, Joan and Chris, and hello, everyone. It's great to be uh, with you all today. And um, we are going to be looking at the old framework for ethical learning technology. And I guess maybe to start off, um, I'm going to just talk through a little bit of the rationale for developing it and I will pass on to Sharon who will talk a little bit more about how we're looking to apply it and how we're also linking it into accreditation schemes like CMALT um, and linking it to you know, the potential to develop case studies and then we'll maybe um, think about you know, potential questions that you might have but also maybe some points for discussion uh, so we can maybe unpick some of this a little bit more. So um, to kick things off um, I think it's fair to say that our perceptions of um, and perspectives on technology have probably been evolving. You know, sometimes we talk about looking back in, in time through sort of rose tinted spectacles. And I think certainly my perspective of technology has gone through various permutations. One, starting off probably quite optimistically back in about, I don't know, the early 2000s. Um, and as we moved into the sort of 2010s, 11s, 12s onwards, maybe a few concerns about um, some of the maybe unintended consequences of technology. And we began to see maybe some of the social impacts of technology and digital and society, um, moral responsibilities and some of the ethical dilemmas. Um, and I'm sure some of you may be aware of a, a book by Andrew Keane called Cult of the Amateur, which I think was around 2008, 2009. Um, and his concerns about, you know, the the web and digital was very much democratising information, but actually, um, did that also come with some risks? And we see now um, people can pretty much write what they want, and we've got deep fakes and all the rest of it. So we have these 
unintended consequences. Um, and even back in 2016, Spectre um, proposed that did we need to have some kind of educratic oath in education? So just as uh, medics have the Hippocratic oath, um, do we need something similar in education? And he came up with this sort of model or a values hierarchy really for, for learning environments. And um, and if you look at the sort of little steps in this um, hierarchy, you can begin to see as we think about learning environments and their accessibility, that very much links into concepts like universal design for learning, which came to the fore during COVID, um, and also the accessibility legislation, which came into play uh, across Europe in 2019. And then as we move up this hierarchy, thinking about sustainability and, and making sure also that no harm is done, and I guess that also then links into things like learning data ethics and also things like GDPR and privacy and some very sort of high profile cases recently, particularly at the University of Bristol, um, looking at you know, what is our responsibility in terms of how we deal with um, learning data and, and analytics. Um, and I think really Alt recognised very much the same challenges and issues emerging around technology. And so um, it decided it would have this project um, started in 2020 uh, to develop this ethical framework for using learning technology. And so that work started and um, Sharon and I had the privilege of co-leading that piece of work together with uh, Bella Abrams, who was also a trustee at the time. She's the head of IT at Sheffield University. Um, and we started that work um, and we had a number of open members meeting. We met with the old assembly, but we also invited members of the community to form a sort of working group. And we started off, I think Bella came to a meeting suggesting we start by looking at some of the research ethics frameworks. So we, we very much took that and some other models of, um, of ethics uh, frameworks and um, just began to discuss those, ruminate over them, um, and slowly begin to draft our own first set of ethical principles. And they were ready by sort of January 2021. They went out for broader consultation and um, we refined them a little bit more. And then there was a, an open consultation uh, May to June 2021. We had 165 um, responses to that, not just from the UK, but globally, which was fantastic to see. Um, and then that that feedback was very much distilled. Um, and then we were delighted really then to be able to launch the ethical framework in December 2021. And uh, thanks Sharon for sharing that, uh, the link. And this was really the framework. And you can see there are sort of four areas that we've highlighted that we, we think you need to really think about when we're, we're using digital um, in learning and education. And the first really relates to awareness. And I think for me, key is, key is that whole thing of being reflective practitioners. And I think that applies to all of us, whether we're librarians, we're lecturers, we're learning technologists, um, whatever our role. Um, so reflecting on our practice and thinking critically. Also being aware of our own limitations in terms of our knowledge, but also maybe um, our own unconscious bias. Um, and also, I think having that awareness of actually the impact of digital um, and the ways that we practice and the things that we develop and the services that we design and deliver uh, to, the, to the stakeholders that we work with, whether that's students, whether it's staff, members of the public. There's that whole area of care in the community. So one, practicing care of ourselves and others. Um, and again, I think central, and I think we see it here in the SIG group and we see it in many of the groups that run through ALT and ALT actually as a whole is that whole sense of collegiality, collaboration, mutual understanding, wanting to learn from each other and support each other, um, but also recognising that um, we can also influence beyond our own institutions and our own teams. And again, I think that's the beauty of, of groups like this coming together to sort of share our experiences and expertise and disseminating that good practice. Then there's the whole thing of professionalism um, and coming from a medical education background. For me, that's very much, I think, about role modelling um, and demonstrating that account kind of accountable evidence led practice. Um, it's that commitment to ongoing professional development, acting with integrity and honesty 
Um, and again, that awareness of complying with law and legislation. Copyright is a prime example. I'm always astounded by how many of my academic colleagues are just completely oblivious to copyright law. Um, and when we do audits of the BLE, what you know, we find a sort of little shop of horrors hidden, hidden away in modules. Um, so yes, trying to trying to make sure that we're aware of actually what our legal responsibilities are and also being an advocate for those ethical approaches and then obviously values and I think here again it's that sense of inclusion being aware that actually digital poverty is a thing people with disability do have challenges using some of our systems so making sure again that we're very inclusive that we that, you know, that we do make education open to all and accessible to all and and again just being accountable and transparent in the way that we work so that sort of is a summary of, of the framework and I'm now going to pass on to Sharon. Thank you so much Natalie. Um, yeah it's it's been a really interesting journey I suppose and as Natalie said we kicked off in 2020 and then the the framework was launched um, very shortly after the consultation um, and um, a lot of thought and, and there had been a lot of as, as as Natalie indicated, a lot of thought in putting together that framework, organizing it. Um, and, and then the launch was was really exciting. Um, and, you know, we got a lot of comments back and we said, well, look, we'll, we'll have to see how this works in practice. And, um, you know, maybe in a little while we can come back and revisit it. Um, but, you know, you, you put so much effort into getting the, the, the original document together and the original framework together and the beautiful graphics, etc. Um, sorry, I'm just going to notice that my uh, my laptop is low on juice, so I'm just going to try and make sure that we are OK. Um, but the next stage then was to really look at, um, I'm going to start moving actually, um, was to look at embedding it um, and to make sure that people could actually start using the framework in a meaningful way. So, um, uh, Marin Deepwell um, within um, ALT had already, I suppose, anticipated some of this. And so um, the um, ethical considerations had already been started to be embedded in the um, in the the CMALT framework from 2019, from before we even began talking about um, the the ethical framework. Um, and so there were already some prompts and some some, um, I suppose, requirements within the framework to start thinking about it, about ethical considerations, um, and then the framework itself. Once we we brought it into into play and launched it, um, it was very important then to start uh, um, actually embedding it into uh, people's work. So, um, a number of resources began to be developed, um, and the first set of resources was. Um, self-assessment um, template. So the self-assessment template, um, which you can find at the link that, that I posted earlier, um, there are two templates available. Um, there's an individual template because obviously we want to try and be ethical in, in what we do as individuals, as professionals within our own job, within our own place of work. Um, but it's also very important to be able to come together as a team and particularly when you start talking about values and, and having shared values of a team. Um, this can be quite a useful thing to do to come together as a team and to look at, you know, um, uh, are, are we being ethical in our work? Are we taking um, these these ethical considerations into into our practice as a group? So um, so both of those. Uh, templates were quite important and I'm just going to speak a little bit more about those. So um, with the self-assessment template um, or tool, um, it can be used in a number of different ways. So you could use it, for example, to um, as a lens to reflect on a particular piece of work that you are focusing on. You could look, use it um, for um, perhaps a piece of work that you're about to, to, to launch into, perhaps as part of a project um, or a new tool or a new platform that you want to um, focus on. So um, that flexibility was built into um, putting together these templates. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the uh, self-assessment in, in, in just a moment, but the, the two tools, the one for, um, for groups and the one for individuals are pretty much the same thing. 
it's just obviously you complete one as, a, as an individual or you complete the other um, as a team. The uh, templates are available to download from the website. They are openly licensed and they are free to use. And they are also now mapped to the CMALT framework. Um, there is, I understand, a micro-credential, and I know that, um, and, and I will come to a slide which says that you, you can go and fill out a form, but I haven't been able to find the online form, so I'm not sure that that's fully available just at the moment, but it's something that I'm going to check on after today. So um, the first step in the self-assessment, and this looks at the individual um, self-assessment form, um, the first thing that you're asked to, to think about is, is what is the focus of this? So what we're doing with this form is using the self-assessment and the framework as a lens to look at a particular aspect of your work. So as I said, it could be that you're looking at a particular tool or a platform that you're using or that you're launching or that you're, you're recommending to students or to staff. Um, it could be while you're developing or reviewing a particular policy or a process. It might be a particular project that you're 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 about to launch into, and this is just maybe something that you could do alongside the other aspects of the the project and project management. Um, it could be a particular aspect of your own work, um, or it could be something else. So it's it's quite open. So you would uh, select that first and then begin into the self assessment. There are um, two parts to the self assessment. So part A is where you reflect. Um, and essentially what this does is it looks at the four areas that Natalie spoke about um, just a few minutes ago, awareness, professionalism, values, care and community. And you look at the various uh, bullet points within each of those um, areas and reflect, does this apply? Um, have we thought about this? Um, is this something that 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 um, is of value to, of, uh, to us, um, et cetera? And, and basically just fill in the the, the boxes on, the, on the, the form. You are also encouraged to reflect on any barriers. So it could be, for example, that you can't do things in a certain way because of an institutional policy or practice. There may be structural bar barriers. There may be resource barriers, operational constraints, et cetera. And again, it's just an opportunity to reflect on that. Um, there's a, a, a little scoring mechanism, very, very simple scoring mechanism. Um, and part B then takes that scoring mechanism um, allows you to take a summary of your scores and then encourages you to think about um, focusing on some of those areas. So focusing on particular current practice and areas for development. So you can see how that might fit into the, the CMALT framework. Um, now, this is, this is the slide that, that, I, that I was saying that I'm not actually sure that the, the online self-assessment form is available, but I'm going to check with, on that um, after today. Um, and there is a, a, an open badge from ALT which can recognise the fact that, you know, not that, that you are a superstar ethically, but rather that you have done the self-assessment. And then the badge and indeed elements of your own self-assessment, you don't have to share the self-assessment itself, um, can be used as evidence in your CMOLD portfolio. So that is one area of adopting the framework and one way that you might be interested after today to take a look at the form and to think about how you might apply that in your own work, either as an individual or as a group. And um, beyond that, there is now an ALT award for case studies of ethical ed tech. And we are looking to collect more examples of case studies from all areas across higher and further education. Um, in terms of case studies and policies from individuals um, and institutions. So specifically, we're looking for example policies um, from institutions which would ideally be openly licensed, um, case studies of professional practice from different contexts, case studies from institutions, and we're also looking for case studies from vendors that's not as applicable today. Um, we're also very interested to hear how the framework has been used um, how it's been adopted, what people are doing with it, the ways that people are, are using it. Um, and this actually was, was um, within the context of generative AI. This was a, a theme in the, the Alt Winter Summit. Thank you, Natalie, for um, adding the, the playlist there. Some really interesting talks there. If you, if you, if you weren't at it or you haven't um, seen any of it, do go and have a look at the playlist. Um, certainly encourage you to do that. So, Natalie, that's that's my bit over. Do you want to um, move on? 
Yeah, thanks, Sharon. So I just wonder, um, in the context of what um, we've presented so far, I just wonder whether um, the audience might want to think about how do, how do they think that the framework might apply to their own practice? Um, and maybe just put that in the text, in the, in the chat, just to see what kind of things have been provoked so far. We've, we've got a few slides with some kind of statements that might um, identify a few areas, but we're just really keen to hear from you. Uh, where do you think um, the ethical framework maybe is, is relevant to your own practice? Yeah, so that's interesting, Jane. So I'm just going to quickly move this. Oh, I was wondering what Chris was trying to say. <laughs> yeah, sorry about that. Chris is just he's, he's using another laptop here and something went weird when he was trying to type something in. So, but yeah, we were just wondering. So I know that, that quite a lot of um, people have been asked to think a bit about, um, I, I'm thinking specifically in a sort of library context around AI tools that you might use for do you know helping you do things like literature reviews some of the tools that are out there um i think is there one called elucidate or something like that or illicit or something there's one that yeah will summarize yeah illicit that's the one yeah and research rabbit and those kinds of things so yeah that that's exactly that's what you're going to say i'll shut up i'll let you carry on no no that that's fine um and I think it's interesting because um, I've noticed that my library colleagues have started doing sessions for students on using some of these tools. And also um, there are some we were just contacted by an academic earlier in the week who has um, incorporated generative AI into an assignment. And it's a very well thought through assignment. And again, it mentions using some of these tools that are on this slide. Um, and but the one thing they've not really thought about is actually um, how do these tools deal with everyone's data? What are the privacy issues? Um, and, I, and I guess it's I don't know if everyone is aware, but essentially since GDPR came into being and even before GDPR, actually, um, universities have had a duty of care around the, the tools which we which we buy and that we then use in our institutions. Um, so essentially, whenever we buy or procure a new tool, um, they the vendor and even those um, sort of bidding on the tender will have to submit things like a web security um, form um, so we can be sure about how they're processing data, about their security, whether third parties have access to their servers, all this sort of thing, and to the data. Um, and then we will also do things like privacy impact assessments. We will also do equality impact assessments to again look at issues around how it may impact um, students with disabilities or staff with disabilities. Um, so all of those things are considered and then there's also um, the whole information governments and the data processing agreements which look very closely into how what's done with the data, um, how is it stored, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So all those things have to be looked at before we um, buy a product. And it, it, this, in a sense, I think where we are with Gen AI, and Sharon, you probably could comment on this as well, is we're a bit like we were, I think, with social media, probably back around 2010, 12, 13, 14, where lots of lecturers were incorporating social media into their teaching, asking students to sign up to Twitter and things. And now we sort of look at it, look back in horror, I think, particularly when we see what's happened to Twitter um, or X as it's now known. But it's what's happening with the data. So I think one is, are we looking at that? And I know there's one tool, Otter AI, that has been banned, certainly um, on, it's on the blacklist at Dundee. Um, but are we doing due diligence about all these other tools before we let students actually have a look at them? Do we ever look at the privacy statements when we sign up to them? Um, can we make students use a tool that isn't an institutional tool? Um, and we also know that some students are then choosing to pay for these tools. And so that 
that immediately raises issues around equity of access and it's interesting because there was one of the sessions at the old winter winter summit which was a student panel and there were some students there who were who were paying for chat gpt but you know not all students can afford to do that mm -hmm. um so we do have co-pilot within um within edge microsoft edge so certainly at dundee what we're saying is to, to lecturers and to our library colleagues is that if you are wanting students to use these tools, you can't force them to do that. But, um, but we do have co-pilot within Edge, um, so those students can use that. Or if you want them to do it, you could suggest that they sign up using a university email address rather than um, their own personal email address. Um, so Sharon, I don't know if you've got any other comments on that. I, I suppose the only other thing to to add to that is, and and we're all familiar with this, is you know you 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 when you do sign up to these, whether it's free or whether you've you've paid for them, um, you you also sign these terms and conditions, which which virtually nobody looks at, um, and and as well as as their own personal data, um, uh, many students are 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 I suppose providing inputs to these tools in terms of their intellectual property and. Um, we we really have no idea where this may eventually end up. Um, we've seen plenty of examples, particularly over the last couple of years, where um, where companies have decided that they are going to um, you know sell on data um, or to indeed use um, potentially student work to to improve um, the the tool into the future or to improve other tools into the future. So it's it's really as as Natalie says, you know when. Um, when a, a higher education institution make, signs a contract with a particular um, edtech vendor, um, we have these these um, safeguards that are in place. But if you're if you're sort of um, encouraging or or in some cases requiring students to to sign up individually, um, it's it's really difficult to control. And um, yeah, so so certainly having that that educational or that that ethical lens to look at it as as a, a framework and just to be aware of the potential implications of this it's it's incredibly important yeah and just as you were saying that Sharon what came to mind was I remember when canvas the VLE was sold mm. um yep. by its original owners and they were the 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 people I can't remember which company bought it now but I remember they explicitly said we've bought it for the data because we've got all this data on students so the students were the very much the commodity in that um and I guess linked to what Sharon was saying there. Um, so I just wonder what this um, statement might provoke, whether anyone has any comments or thoughts on, um, on actually the ethics of even using generative AI tools. Do you want people to and put something in the chat or are you yeah, happy put, to yeah, put something in the chat and, and put their hands up as well because I know we, your hand up. Yeah, yeah because we've had quite a, a we've had a couple of webinars last year about um, AI and some of the implications mm -hmm. of this and lots of people um, who are the copyright specialists are being asked to sort of comment on. I, I think this is a really, really interesting statement for me. The yeah. thing that um, if, if you're using the word stolen you're using the word theft i mean it's something that f from the, those of us who who are copyright specialists and arch pedants would point out that it, infringement of copyright is not necessarily the same thing as theft because if you're stealing something then you are taking something of some from someone else and you are then depriving them from owning it whereas mm. we're, we're talking about copying and using um things without authorization it doesn't necessarily deprive the original creator or owner. Well, you don't take of, it from. You don't them. take it from them, but you are taking some. I mean, it, 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 it's it's really I think about the the language that we use, mm. and that is increasingly the, the case with with AI and, and and people's worries and fears about it. Um, that it means that we are leaning on using copyright law and using intellectual property rights laws as a as a sort of shorthand for. It, it seems like a bad thing. It yeah. sounds, looks like a bad thing, and copyright is the thing that protects us from this bad thing of people taking stuff that, that isn't theirs. And I, you know that 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 kind of position isn't going to go away, and that's going to increasingly be there. But it's whether we can kind of feed in more of the. But there's a bit of balance involved in this. This is mm. how intellectual property laws are, are are intended. They're supposed to be a limitation to how much control 
the original creator has mm. over the, the stuff that they've created because there's a broader cultural and societal benefit in this stuff being out there it's yeah does it own to any does, you know does any one person get to control or organization control how it gets used yeah yeah and I think it is you know it's 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 quite a I think what you what you have to see is that it it, it will be some you know in in the creative industries there will there is there is a you know a clear um line and view that that you know the content needs to be kind of protected largely because it's big companies wanting to monetize that mm. content mm. and not wanting other mm. people to use it and they will be very um you know negative around copyright exceptions being used whether it's being yeah. used by companies or whether it's you know we're all kind of like in the same boat so it's 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 really hard because i think a lot of us feel quite nervous about the way that copyright is being used i think as a way to say well that's why ai is wrong yeah and here's the way we crack down on the fact that it's wrong and it's going to destroy humanity yeah and i see liesl has got a comment in the chat as well which is interesting that the um from your perspective your institution's gone quite conservative asking staff students to look at terms and conditions and not to feed copyright data into it no so you wouldn't use the word theft but you also want users to be aware that they could be giving data that they don't want to or it's not theirs to air and i think that is the, absolutely the key thing that, that most of us are focusing on is, i think so i think if you're you're advising sort of phd students or academics doing research mm. and they're saying oh look great there's all these free tools available that will you know shortcut me doing my data analysis so yeah. we talked about this didn't we with yeah. using that and actually the, the the ethics um that we signed up to as part of doing research at the university of oxford mm -hmm. doesn't let us use third party tools to analyze no. our data no, it doesn't. i wonder how many researchers are just doing it though and going ahead and but not I, thinking about it i think what we should definitely we'll a call stop, we'll a, stop. we're going to stop talking in a moment yeah, a call back a call back to the webinar that we did with alex fenland from birmingham yeah. who i think is on the call today and um, i'll put a link to that because we, we covered some of the sort of detail on that we uh, did or, yeah so yes but thank you written back to back to you sharon <laughs> no i think that's really interesting and i think um it, this also i think speaks back to sharon's point because just this week i think um it's been announced that WordPress.com and Tumblr, who are both um, owned by the same parent company, are basically giving all their data. So all the data that people have published on Tumblr and WordPress.com is going to be made available to OpenAI to build their engine. Um, mm. So it, it is it does, I think, throw up some real tricky issues. And this statement, I actually saw a comment. Somebody had written a comment on on LinkedIn that was saying that if you used generative AI, you were a thief. Um, which I, So I kind of just made a little twist on that sort of um, statement. But obviously there are these class actions going on in the States, New York Times um, suing open AI because they feel they've moved well, well beyond fair use. So I'm sure this is an issue that's going to be very hotly, hotly debated for some time to come. Sharon, shall I move along to? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this was one that um, that um, um, you know, I, I suppose there's been rumblings of, of it. Um, oh, I think we've lost Sharon. Yeah, I was just going to say I can't hear Sharon now. Is yeah, it? I think she's disconnect. Yeah, so I'll wait. I'll leave that one until Sharon reconnects, and I'll maybe just um, I'll maybe go to this one. Um, so Using I'm guessing AI to... Sharon's back. Oh, did I did I drop? Yeah, we lost you for a second. On your oh, go, okay. Sharon. Sorry, I was just saying I came across a headline in a paper which 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 mentioned um staff. Um, using Gen AI to grade students' papers. Um, now, I think it was actually at, at, um, at, at you know a school level, but um, at the same time, it just kind of it raised the, the you know I can feel the hairs rising on the back of my neck, um, and and it's it's all it's tied up in this narrative around um, making academics' lives easier. Um, 
and and I, I came across this this paper last night, which is it's a it's a, um, a speculative, I suppose, case study, um, presenting the case of a, a of a, a uni university professor considering the implications of um, uh, using AI to grade student papers and and a case of implications, and uh, it's just something that that. Um, I, it's 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 a thing that's been sold to academics as this is going to make your life easier and you can spend your time doing maybe other higher value things than than basically grading papers and for me i just i feel a little bit sick in my stomach when i think about this and and when it comes to ethics and there is a little section on ethics in in this particular paper um but but my first response is why on earth would students go to the effort of writing something if they know that 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 their lecturer isn't even going to read it, um, but I feel I feel very saddened that we've reached this point, and and I just thought I'd include this um, just to see what what people thought or 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 whether you think that that there there may be um, maybe I'm just overreacting, maybe I'm just been around too long, and and maybe this is the way we're going, but um, I, I I really hope this isn't. Um, but I know I know for sure because my my background is computer science. Um, that um, uh, that there will be people working on this. There, there will be computer scientists working on this. You know, how can we build a tool that will be able to fully grade student papers? Yeah, yeah. You see, Jane, computer scientists. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Just yesterday, just yesterday, I spoke to somebody um, who is really interested in the fact that you know when you have really large classes um and i you know i get it i mean i teach yeah. up to sort of 25 and i you know i find marking 25 assignments pretty hard going i can't imagine if i had 400 undergraduates but i mean i know that you don't you know typically you get a team of people to do it but one of the things that we discussed was um you know trying to make it a bit more standardized so using things like rubrics and some of the tools that are in you know vles like moodle and features of turnitin but um i just wonder if it could be taking it then uh, to the next stage as you say what would a student actually think if they thought for a minute that their lecturer hadn't read their paper and it had been marked by an ai i mean i think it's a really interesting question to have in light of the fact that you could potentially end up with them with students papers that are written by an AI and marked by an AI and you yeah wonder, exactly what is, the point? what is the point of any assessment then <laughs> but I, I think you know there. and I think I think you're right Jane because what this what this says to me is and you know and I've been saying this for the last 15 years is that assessment is broken but this really this yeah this this breaks the back of it this yeah. this tells me that that our assessment systems i mean why are we doing it if 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 we're going to get into this cycle of students using the ai to to, to write the assessments and then we use the the ais to to mark them it it's it makes a mockery of the entire system it does it really it really does and i agree with you entirely that it's it's where i kind of end up really frustrated and thinking you know we have to kind of get to a point then to say is there any point to the assessment? Well, what you might find is that the the, the lecturer robots uh, end up generating a new whole new generation of really excellent essay writing robots that, that <laughs> advance advanced scholarship much more than the humans ever did. Yeah. Sorry, that's a glib statement. We can yeah. Move on. Yeah. Yeah, we've got loads of great comments coming up in the chat. I don't I don't know if you two are following. I don't know if you yeah. want to pick up on any of the points. Um, yeah, I think. I think Nikki makes the great point. Why be a lecturer if you don't want to read assignments? Um, and I think some of the it's interesting. Some of the conversations I've been involved recently have focused on the issue that you know in the UK we tend we tend to have anonymous marking, which is already depersonalising the sort of relationship between the the lecturer and the student. Um, and that doesn't seem to be the case in other countries. I know, for example, in Australia they don't have anonymous marking. Um, but then if you're going to also then have a I know an AI doing the marking um, that depersonalizes it even more. But I think again, Rachel's comment there about um, actually AI helping to improve the students work. And I think it's interesting speaking to disability colleagues who who do prescribe some of these tools um, to students to help them with proofreading and the grammar, things like Grammarly, obviously helping students with their writing. 
And my own experience of teaching some students recently, and we had several discussions about AI, and many of them are actually using it to sort of um, put you know, submit drafts and get feedback, how to improve the writing, um, the proofing, all of that sort of thing, the spelling. Um, so it is actually helping them to hone their work. And it was interesting that their argument was, well, often if you try and give a formative um, submission to a lecturer, they often haven't got time to read it and give you formative feedback. But often when you're doing work and you're thinking about how you're going to structure your essay or your assignment, you'll be discussing it with your friends anyway. So they were saying, what's the difference between doing that with friends who may give you some intellectual input um, than using you know, a generative AI tool? So I think there's a sense in which AI is kind of, we've, we've known it's been there for years, but this kind of the generative AI has exploded on the scene. And I think amongst, we're so busy and stretched, thinking time is really kind of key. So I think it's, um, I think discussions like this and conversations are really key to helping us find a place where we're kind of happy with all of this in a sense. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I do, I'm just conscious of time. I know we've had quite a lot of mm. questions as we're going on um, as well, but um, did you, have you got, do you have any, yeah, do you want, have you got further slides to present or are we kind of now in oh, general qu oh. questions? Because I think, I mean, this is fascinating. Really yeah, I think I think general questions given the time. But yeah, yeah. the other slides yeah. we've got were just provocations really for discussion. So yeah, uh, yeah let's let's take questions. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I I I have a question, and I think mm -hmm. it's or, or sort of an area for discussion. And this is what kind of prompted me to to want to to bring you on to the the webinar in the first place. Is when those of us who are responsible for copyright get asked questions about what we should be doing or what what the copyright implications are there's often a feeling you know our job is compliance some of us actually have compliance in our job titles to make mm. sure we're following the rules but when it comes to ethics often what the rules say and what the right thing to do are not necessarily the same thing so i'm just wondering whether to what extent and maybe this this is a question for the people on the call as as much as it is for you all as as much as it is for you um Kathleen, Sharon, is to what extent does the, the framework that you've created help us as copyright specialists and practitioners to come up with the with the right answers? I've always we Jane and I have always had ethics actually in our definition of what we talk about when we talk about copyright literacy. Mm. It's enabled to create the ethical creation and use of copyright material. We don't have lawful. No. We don't have you know authorized. We have ethical. Yeah, because so we I, we really don't like this view that mm. that you you're sort of a copyright person is is all about compliance and and doing that kind of you know as you said the little shop of horrors the audit of the VLE and then having to go around and tell everybody you know no 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 take all that down the question arises like okay there's stuff that arguably is infringing copyright on the VLE is that really a problem if students are getting high quality resources if we are you know, if we're su we're supporting the the mission of the institution to mm. to to help its students, um, and it's also we were talking about some of the other wider ethical considerations. It's mm. copyright's not the 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 one that that should override things like accessibility, should mm -hmm. it? And some of the other concerns that we have about, you know, I, I think that that is the problem that sometimes it does it, it becomes yeah. like the thing. That, that dictates above all else. And so what I was hoping we would do in, in, in just having this discussion within our community is think about how we can, when we're brought into those conversations, how we can be aware of the broader ethical thing. I mean, we are thinking about the broader ethical considerations all the time, but you know, is this a useful framework for us to use? Is there something that we as the copyright community can contribute to the framework? What kind of case studies might they look like where we're, you know, being asked these questions and kind of balancing what's lawful against what's ethical. Yeah, I I think the key because I think one of the one of the criticisms that was levelled to us when we were developing the framework was individuals' agency to be able to raise ethical mm. concerns. Mm. And I think this is why um, you know as Sharon was outlining the ability to use the toolkit actually as a team. So, you know, work through it with a team, think, you know, to look at different 
um, issues. So copyright's one, but there'll be many other issues. Yeah. Um, the the you know the big thing that's sort of um, taxing a lot of us at the minute is how does digital, you know, how does that tally with trying to be ne a net zero university? Um, yeah. You know, that's that's a real dilemma. Um, so I think it's about I think it's about in our teams. It's instilling those values and that culture where we can talk about it and we can have those conversations and with our academic colleagues and mm. thinking, well, what are the issues? What you know, what's our shared set of values? Um, so that actually then when you're dealing with senior people in the university, there's a sense in which you've got a collective thinking that you can bring to the table. Because I think it's very difficult if you're just a lone voice. Um, yeah. Sharon, what, what do you think? Yeah, I'm I'm just noticing um Simon's comment there. He said his starting point is always wanted to say yes. Um and, and the compliance angle can be a barrier in many ways to that. So so I think um I agree with what Natalie's saying that that I think there's an opportunity to try and to use perhaps the the group self-assessment for particular scenarios, for particular projects, for particular dilemmas that come to you. Because mm. I suppose the difference with copyright is, you know, copyright, it, obviously it's a legal thing. It's it's a, it's a yes or no. Um, it's black and white, mostly, not always, but mostly. And um, whereas, whereas ethics, it's, it's, it's more of an opportunity to explore. Um, and I would see perhaps um, the, the self-assessment exercise as being a way to reflect on and to explore the issues and to find a balance um, that could then become an enabler or perhaps even go so far as to become um, an, um, an enabling um, guideline or set of guidelines in a particular area. And I think there's a huge role for, for, for people like you who are working in that type of area, often within, within a library situation, to to use that in that way to to provide those enabling guidelines um, ultimately. I th thank you. So I think that's an excellent point and I think it's a good point to end it on. I think what we're going to take away from this and certainly take back to our special interest group, I think there's um, a real opportunity to build on what on what Simon's saying is if we if we do have the starting point as wanting to say yes and therefore the compliance we avoid the computer says no situation if we're guided by the ethical framework as to what we're saying yes to, then our job as copyright specialist is to find a way to make that work. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that is kind of the approach that we've been taking for quite some time, but it might be worth actually making that explicit statement. Um, and we can, yeah, we, we can take that away and think about it. But thank you so much. So that's been an absolutely brilliant. Ho hopefully yeah. maybe see if we can get some people to want to contribute some case studies as yeah, well yeah, yeah. for you. That would be um, wonderful. Yeah, and I think just one other sort of final thing as well. I mean, quite a lot of people on the call are probably librarians and there is a an ethical framework that SILIP has as well. So I don't know if it's worth looking or if you did, you know, look at that when you were sort of drawing up, you know, because professional bodies um, obviously do work together sometimes. And I think in there is a there's an overlap between those two sort of frameworks as well. So it's not to say that librarians don't think about ethics because they do hugely <laughs> when they're making lots of decisions about, you know, the, student, the, the people's data and what tools to purchase and things like that. So, yeah, it's been fantastic. Thank you so much. We are at 12 o'clock, so um, we know lots of people have to um, disappear, but we just want to thank you, um, Sharon and, and Natalie. I hope this is going to be um, the start of some further interesting collaborations between mm -hmm. um, our group um, and and the two of you and, and people working on the framework. So, yeah, thank you. Huge thanks. Thanks very much. Yeah. Um, so very briefly, just to say coming up next, we have uh, the 19th of April is yes. the next date that we've got, which is going to be the return to the ever popular Becoming a Copyright Specialist session where we want three people to come forward we've got people in mind so we will be picking on you but if anybody if anyone does, wants to do this yeah, yes then please let us know it's always fascinating to hear people's journeys yeah um, and the approaches that they take yeah so, and there has been three of these webinars um mm. to date and so if you're wanting to see the kinds of things that people talked about do have a look at um the earlier ones but we'd really love some people to come forward as well if you want to volunteer otherwise we're gonna we're gonna as chris says we've got we've got our eyes on a few people so yeah, watch yeah. out 
What's Particularly that? those people putting very intelligent and thoughtful comments in chats and on the discussion lists yeah. will definitely be uh, be in touch. Um, we've got we will rearrange the session um, on third party copyright yes. with Claire and, and Emily. Yes. Uh, the UK RI guide. We, we haven't got a date yet from no, them. Yeah. We'll be doing the copyright anxiety thing. Um, I'm starting to feel nervous. No, no, no. We will finish this research project. Yeah. Uh, cross border licensing is a topic where I think we do we do have something lined up on that. We're going to make sure we frame that well. Um, we've got a volunteer uh we have a volunteer Liesl. okay excellent Liesl. yes uh thought you might uh, yeah yes picked up on that rather pointed reference uh okay and control digital lending we've spoken about there is a separate event but i suspect we'll probably return to it at some point later yeah this year. yeah i think we probably will any other topics please let us know yeah yeah um, we're, we're always open to suggestions for webinars yeah. so we've just got one last thing haven't we one last thing we're not going to play the music no. but uh yeah one last thing this was also another um uh, part of our, our exciting couple of days working on our research in oxford yep. and we we went along to a new exhibition that had opened it's called write cut and rewrite it's at the western library and it's actually um uh, running until in oxford um until the 5th of january so you've got loads of time if you want to go along and see it um and it's really about the kind of work that um goes on by authors sort of when they're drafting their their text there's mm. loads of famous um, writers aren't there, there um, are. they've got loads of amazing manuscripts and the editing process so you know, the, the what you can see from the manuscript shows the creative process that goes on and the the job that i mean we had the, the head of faber and faber was there sort of making the point that publishers do editing but they don't really do what the writer does in terms of actually that whole process of working out what does and doesn't work and also we were then had a really interesting conversation because a lot of these were obviously manuscripts or they were typed and you mm. could see the corrections that the author had put on and we were i was speculating how is that ever going to be preserved um in the digital world and sort of mm. version history and some of the things we did when we were writing um, copyright and e-learning to keep earlier versions because we we thought somebody would want to do a big exhibition of that once but we we did we found something that amused us that we wanted to share or it amused me no end um so anyone who might have played our game the publishing trap um and got towards the end we have a character in it who's actually um called simon and he's studying jane austen mm. and we have a little scenario where he finds um an unpublished jane austen manuscript which chris rather amusingly called the trousers of mr bingley long lost trousers of mr bingley yeah. yes anyway we're, there is actually a long lost manuscript of jane austen and it doesn't mention mr bingley's trousers and it doesn't have anything to do with colin firth's shirt no it mr. doesn't Darcy's shirt, no, which no. also just popped up recently as well but there is there is a long lost manuscript of jane austen so we might have to make some am amendments to the publishing trap mm. and uh yeah i've got a photo of that that um th that manuscript as well apparently she lots of her manuscripts were all they're, they're not not been preserved because yeah. authors didn't keep them then and this is a very rare thing because it's in her handwriting but please so yeah if you get the chance to come to oxford uh it'd be fantastic i would say to, to go and visit that and if you are there and if you're around drop, drop me a line because i might be there as well uh, mm. But yeah, uh, great it. to see you there. That's yeah. it. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you, again. everyone. Thanks to everyone who's turned up. Thank you, uh, Natalie and Sharon, once again. And uh, we will stop our recording and let you all get your lunch.